I'm going to uh, start with, uh, with Abdul, in fact, as he was, uh, he was first in our list and uh, put you on the spot. Maybe you could just say a little bit about uh, George as well, but yeah. uh, very glad that yeah. you could join us for, for this session. So, Abdul, could you give us your, your insights, please? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Abdul Hafiz Kuruma, I'm the national coordinator of the National Wash Committee, Republic of Liberia. Um, Darren clearly said that Minister George Yangu wouldn't be attending, and that's only because there's a moratorium placed on ministers traveling in the month of August uh, by the president. And the key reason is because they need to be in country while the budget is being passed. So I'm um, happy to share our experiences uh, from the government with you. And I hope um, in a few minutes I can uh, pitch to you what exactly is happening in Liberia um, regarding national planning processes and how those can be sustained. Um, I want to give a small, just a brief background on what has happened since. And that's uh, piggybacking on SWA and exactly how the government of Liberia was able to uh, use the initiative uh, to a very high advantage. Um, in, in March of last year, the government was able to develop the WASH Compact. Uh, that has really set the basis for development of a sector strategic plan, and currently the development of a sector investment plan. There's also the development of a cap capacity development plan underway, and all of these actually have set the basis for uh, planning in the sector. Um, quickly want to throw to you that the environment politically um, has been enabling, uh, especially with the fact that our president, most of you might know, is the uh, water ambassador. I think this is a second term. So at that level, it is, uh, there's really a huge opportunity uh, for the sector. What has been a small challenge um, is that at the cabinet level, it's a little difficult to get some of um, our process is true. And the reason is because currently there is really the issue of conflicting priorities with regards to the Ministry of Finance and our own sector. There is a strong uh, motivation at the level of Finance Ministry to prioritize energy and infrastructure. So what is happening is, is that at the moment, being the key government agency responsible for pulling all the resources together, lending and everything. It's a sort of a challenge for sector actors to really pound into the Ministry of Finance and get them to think the way we're thinking. Um, and that quite recently, what has been the challenge is also with regards to the country assistance strategy of the World Bank. I would just want to talk a little bit about that because it's really a good example of showing you how a challenge it is. Um, with that support really hanging in, we are thinking that the Ministry of Finance, being fully on board, will have been really an advantage to have put a request in the, to the bank to include WASH in the CAS. Um, that has been a real challenge for the sector. Um, after giving you a little background on what it looks like in country, I want to now focus on the, the, the topic, which is really on sustaining the processes and the dialogue. It's probably good at this stage to mention that uh, if we can step up advocacy um, using, through civil society, um, and that is only because we think this should be driven by government, uh, we believe that uh, we can be able to sustain uh, this sort of dialogue that has taken place, especially with the government uh, going through all of these different planning processes, producing all of these different, uh, different policy documents. Uh, if we can step up our activities through CSOs, and probably I might elaborate later on what really is happening in that regard, I believe that we can sustain the, um, the process that we've all set out to achieve. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Abdul. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back to you, um, see if we can tease out uh, a little, little bit more detail on 
you know, where you see uh, Liberia's challenges and how you think the process within SWA um, can support uh, the continuation of that engagement. You've been talking a little bit about how planning was uh, a mechanism for sustaining and seeing through uh, changes, uh, capitalizing on this political opportunity. But I, I'll come back to you after, after some of the other interventions. Um, maybe we could just, uh, we move a little bit from government through to, to partners with government and CSOs. And I'm wondering, Baker, whether you could share some insights from, from where you sit within the sector on this, this key issue of, of building political capital and then maintaining that political capital, keeping the focus and the finances on sanitation and water for all. Baker? Thank you very much. My names are Baker Iga Matovu. I work with Africa Civil Society Network on water and sanitation. I'm the executive secretary. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, for us from the civil society bit of the sector, we are excited about the process because we've participated since its development. And of course in the high level meeting about 17 national networks participated in the participatory process towards the high-level meeting. And what I'm going to share comes from what we have done so far since the meeting. What is the situation that we are aware of that is going on from the various countries that have participated, the commitments. And of course, it's a very big challenge talking about over 400 commitments. I'm happy Sanjay said he's not very sure whether they want to monitor all or whether it is even possible to do that. Now, what I knew the Africa Civil Society Network is all about is trying to promote participation and engagement of the civil society in a constructive way in various policy and sector service delivery, emphasizing on accountability and good governance and coordination. This is what we look at and what we feel civil society can bring to the table. And in this process of the sanitation and water for all, I would like to say that there are countries that, for example, we know, next to me, Abdu, have been part of the process he's been talking about. And we know that there is good practice, for example, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Ghana, in Malawi and a few other countries who are trying to make sure that this process is very participatory. I'm not saying only those, but examples of countries where good um, experience is taking place. Now, our observation since the high level meeting, which is just about three months ago, is that the dialogue is low, especially there is no continuity the last high-level meeting was in 2010, followed by another one recently in April. Now, between those two, there is a limited discussion, follow-up, and accountability for what has been committed and what has been achieved. So that is an observation. The other one is the there is no clear framework for regular monitoring and reporting against commitments. And I've heard from Sanji that we don't need to create a parallel system, but I think we need to find a way to integrate within the national level, how do we keep accounting? One of the key challenges we come across as non-state actors is that we only work with very good relationships with the political heads and senior civil servants. Now, what the political aspect here and the challenge we come across is there is always change of guards. For example, the minister, I would give you an example. In, in Africa, we've known the minister of water in Uganda to be a key champion of the water and sanitation sector. She's recently changed to another sector. Uh, we also have changes that take place among the senior, the senior civil servants that are key in promoting this. So in taking forward this political dialogue, you are always at a starting point where you have to keep uh, building new relationships and promoting this. 
The other challenge is that the sanitation and water for all initiative is not fully understood by all the key actors. In the Ministry of Water or related departments, yes, but when you go to the Ministry of Finance, it is always a challenge. And if we were talking about to the sector talking to other key players, it becomes a challenge. So how do we optimize this? My feeling is that um, we need to strengthen, first of all, the coordination at national level to make sure that all those who matter in terms of making decisions and promoting water and sanitation goals and objectives are very much aware. And then secondly, we also need to build into the systems, the working, the existing systems, for example, sector performance reviews where they exist, uh, national sector working groups where they exist, civil society groups, uh, development partners working groups, they all need to be on board and at the same level of understanding of the commitments and planning together on how to promote that. Lastly, I think the issue of visibility, popularizing the sanitation and water for all commitments, initiatives among the different uh, state actors and non-state actors and the people we are supposed to account to is very, very paramount. Thank you very much. Thanks, Baker. <laughs> you've, uh, you've rightly critiqued SWA and how far it's reaching, uh, reaching down to national level, and I think that's, uh, it's great to have that perspective. I'm hoping that's something that we can take through this panel discussion, but also in the, in the group work later. And you, you picked out in particular, if I, if I read your your intervention well, coordination, identifying the right types of champions. You, you touched on senior civil servants as people who are persistent within an ever-changing political sphere. And you talked also about visibility and awareness raising amongst the stakeholders. I mean, I, I'll have some questions for you on that, and I want to push you a little bit more on that. But let's, let's hear from our, our next panelist. Um, Heather, if we could, if we could come to you again, switching gears slightly, looking at the perspective from a, looking at the at the sector from a different perspective uh, within USAID. Could you give us some experience about what you think might be next, or what what your what your feelings are on this this issue of political dialogue and engagement? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm Heather Skilling. I'm with the Water Office at USAID in Washington D.C. And as many of you might know, USAID took the occasion of the last high-level meeting to officially join SWA and to express our commitment to the SWA principles. Like many people in the room, we found great value in the whole preparation and conversation that led up to the high-level meeting because they provided an opportunity for us to think about what it truly means to be explicit, transparent and accountable, some of the main ingredients to this topic of political engagement. And what quickly becomes apparent is that the commitments are in fact hollow unless there's a clear path toward implementing those goals and actually being able to achieve and measure results against them. But I think that that's part of the beauty of SWA because on the one hand, it gives us this global family within which to discuss the most effective and equitable way to use our collective resources. But on the other hand, it also extends that political dialogue down to the country level and to focus on the practical tools that are useful at that level to make those commitments real. So in that way, the two levels are mutually reinforcing and they create the self-propelling cycle that was alluded to earlier that allows the priorities to be set, the resources aligned, the disbursements made, and hopefully the results achieved. We were asked to give some thought to how we might move forward and, and enrich this political dialogue. And I think I identified three things. And they're all about building confidence that these public commitments can actually be fulfilled. 
And the first was about creating a shared inventory of resources, because as several several of the panelists have alluded to, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot going on, there's a lot that's already being done. So there's something to be said for creating this inventory of ongoing and new activities, the funding sources, the learning initiatives, the approaches, and better understand how to mobilize these in a coordinated way. The second is that I think, I feel very strongly that we need to be more explicit about capacity. Because at the country level, that's one of the keys to sustainable results. So in Africa, for instance, USAID has been looking at um, the wash capacity of NGOs through a program through CapWash. We've been working closely with our, our AM, AMCAO colleagues, with AFWA. But there's so much that can be done at these local agencies and institutions where things are really going to happen. Finally, I'm going to re-emphasize the point that's been made a couple times about monitoring and developing that base of evidence about results, because this generates the data needed not just to ensure that WASH is prioritized in one cycle, in one budget cycle maybe, but on a continual basis. That is that the more we can show not just hypothetical benefits to investment in WASH, but the more that we can show real results to investment in WASH, I think the more WASH becomes an established priority and not a one-off. Um, it doesn't rise to the top of the pile just once, but always. So enriching the political dialogue, I think, in these ways would not only help us to get that increase in our budget allocations, but also see that those disbursements are made, which has been another part of the puzzle for us, and also ensure that those disbursements are made in an effective way. And anchor WASH as a sustained priority going forward. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Heather. And it was, it was very nicely packaged together, your, your three points. Again, I think that's something that uh, would be good to hear from the group as a whole as, as their reactions to, to those issues around sharing resources, around uh, you know, explicit capacity needs, and, and providing a strong evidence base for this sustained decision making uh, and, and establishment of, of WASH as a priority in the sector. Um, Bymas, so switching, switching gears to you now. and representing AMCAL. I'm wondering whether you could give us a little bit of your thoughts. And if there are things which have already come up from others, then you know, please feel free to skip over those and, and focus on something that the group hasn't heard. Bymas? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Bymas Tal, Executive Secretary of AMCAL. If you do not know me, that means you are a rookie in this process. You are welcome, because I'm becoming a constant furniture. And let me answer this question one for all for this time. People see me with the heart. It's not, nothing to do with the sun, with the rain. I'm rebranding new Nigeria. Our president always wears a heart. So that is it. So no more questions about that. I've been asked in different panels. Now, um, reinforcing the political process. AMCO is, AMCO is all about political process. That's why AMCO was established. It's a political platform. If you look at the mission, it's a political platform for water ministers to dialogue on water policies, program coordination, management, and so forth. What the high level did is part of what AMCO does. We do it at the regional level. It's always good to have a high level at a political level because everything leads to finally before it's implemented that you have political commitment. That's what we try to do. And you have to remember, when we started SWA, we, at the beginning, the, the reason that was that everything was water and sanitation. Sanitation was taking a back seat. We come to the conclusion that we have to bring sanitation at the highest political level in which water was uh, brought. So we established SWA to put, that's why it is sanitation and water, so that there will be political commitment at the country level, that awareness that the, even the budgetary allocation will be there. In countries, you don't have budget line for sanitation. It was, you find it here and there within the cracks. But what SWA and AMCA has managed to do is to bring it at the highest political level and bring the finance ministers also to understand the economic benefits in investing in sanitation. It's not a social service, the economic benefits. So we at AMCO, we have uh, engaged with the finance ministers, you know, in Marseille, 
to make commitments on those. Another thing is that at AMCO, part of the SWAP press process in Africa, we have the leadership in water and sanitation. We are the only ones who report to the heads of states. In January 2013, we are going to report to the heads of states in the summit of all of their commitments in water and sanitation. We are in that process. And those commitments include the Sharm el-Sheikh, includes what happened at uh, Shua. We'll be working with Clarissa and others to get all of those info because we are to report. They have asked us in the last summit, please bring us a report what we have, what has happened on the ground as far as the political process is concerned. So that's what AMCA will be doing to be reporting to a uh, uh, specialized technical committee uh, to the uh, AUC. And other thing that we have done with Water Aid, I have seen Water Aid here, that we have done with ANU, is to have the goodwill ambassador. That's at the highest level, a political level, that wherever she goes, she will talk of water and sanitation. We are even planning with the US government and uh, UN Water during the uh, General Assembly Summit in February to have a side event of one hour. SWA has done it before. We are planning another one where we will try to bring heads of states from Africa to be in that panel and talk about water and sanitation. So the political commitment, we need to continue the momentum. As she said, it's not only a one-off thing that we have a meeting, that's the end, report that there's a meeting. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a building block that moves towards that. In the end, at the country level, there is commitment and investment on the sanitation and water so that you know, uh, all the commitments were made. Finally, I would like to say the easiest thing to have in the world is commitment. Everyone will sign. But what we have experienced that is translating those commitments into practical on the ground. That's where we need the ministers to move from that signing and talking. If I sit here, I'm sitting directly opposite the deputy minister of, uh, of Ethiopia, a colleague who is here. The, these are the people we engage, say, please, let's translate these commitments. The commitments we have fill 500 pages. We need to tr translate it on the ground. That's why we need to work with ANU, with Water Aid, with all the actors on the ground to translate these practical so that we have something to show. Thank you. Thanks, Banas. <laughs> You know, I've, I've never heard a panelist describe themselves as constant furniture, but, um, <laughs> but you're more than welcome, and you're very elegant. You're looking very elegant today with your hat, so, uh, so, so thanks for that. I mean, I, mean, I take away from your, your, uh, your intervention the need for constant messaging, you know, messaging about the economic benefits, uh, to talk a little bit about the sort of tactics that have been used with goodwill ambassadors to maintain that, that engagement, and to, to demonstrate the tangible results that emerge from these types of prioritized investments. Again, so these are, these are some, of the, some of the common threads that I'm beginning to see across, uh, across each of the, the panelists. Our last but by no means least uh, panelist is uh, Malene Blomberg from AFDB. Uh, very happy to have a uh, development bank represented within, within the panel. Um, Malene wasn't originally in the, on, the, on the program, in the printed program, so uh, very happy to, to have AFDB supporting uh, this session. Again, the, the same question for, for you from, from your institutional perspective and your work with, with clients in country. What do you think is making a difference in terms of political engagement around WASH? Thank you very much. Is that on? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Um, yes, my comments are really based on the context of the African Development Bank and the Water and Sanitation Department that I'm representing. Uh, over the last eight years or so, our financing of water and sanitation has increased about 10 times, from about $70 million a year to $700 million a year. And we do think that we will continue at this level going forward. But like many of you, internally we also face the challenges of funding allocation. And this is something that we're continuously faced with. Uh, but we're about to launch a new long-term strategy for the bank. And this will in some ways change the way that we focus our activities, but also the way that we do our work. We will be focusing on green growth, uh, governance, and still infrastructure that is very much linked to development. And cutting across all that is the promotion of private sector participation. Um, I wanted to make three points in, from our perspective then about where we see that sanitation and water for all can uh, continue its focus. 
First of all, I think from the April meeting, one of the greatest accomplishments was the very high level, uh, both numbers and caliber of participants from outside the sector that participated. And as we saw in the challenges um, that were identified in the outcome of that meeting, most of the challenges, we cannot fix them on our own within this sector. We've been very good at convincing each uh, other within the sector of the importance of what we do. And of course, what we do is extremely important. But we need to become even better and as good as explaining it and convincing those outside of the sector. Um, and in this regard, I think it's imperative, uh, along with the efforts of what AMCAO is doing, to also bring these kind of meetings and have them be as successful and high level and important on national level. So the similarities of John Kufour and Jan Eliasson and the other, many other important people, who are they on each national level who would take part in this? We have seen that when we do engage people appropriately, people want to work with us, people do have an interest, but we have to assign them clear roles. They have to bring something as opposed to us just informing them. So we have to find uh, more clever ways to in involve them in our results-driven frameworks. Uh, the next point I wanted to mention is that whilst a lot has been accomplished, we do see there's a huge gap between policy and implementation on the ground. Policy dialogue continues at one speed, but the implementation is just not keeping up. So whilst the continued policy is essential, it may be interesting for sanitation and water for all to also take it one step further in how to operationalize the policy. This does not mean actually doing the implementation, that would be stretching the mandate way too far. But we have to find ways of helping and pushing the, the policy into action. Uh, it, it's really not clear to me why, and I'm facing it on a daily level basis, why is it that we keep doing things that are actually, we know they're not working, yet we do them. For example, why aren't we investing in uh, rehabilitating urban, urban water supply schemes when we know that they will actually fail very soon because of the governance issues surrounding them? We are somehow very optimistic that other actions will come along and resolve those issues magically, but they don't. And yet we don't want to take risks very much. We can pilot risks here and there, um, uh, risky things, but we don't want to scale it up because it's risky. So we prefer to do something that's not working very well than taking on some risks. And this is really the third point and final point I wanted to make, that we have to look maybe at the softer issues of change management, because it's not really the technical pipes uh, and boreholes that is the problem of a sector, but it's really the softer things. We all know what needs to be done, but yet we're not managing to do it. Um, and I think that Sanitation and Water for All can really be a forum, a safe forum, where we can discuss the issue of risks, for example. Why are we not able to scale up uh, the, the pilot results that we're seeing uh, and involving the private sector more, for example? The, the issue of capacity was raised, um, and I think it's very important. Uh, we cannot expect that, and I see this again in my organization, as much as the, the beneficiary countries um, that we are funding, we have a certain capacity and skills in our departments and we're asking them to do things very differently, to do, use other business models, but we don't necessarily have the skills. And this again can be sometimes sensitive to talk about um, because people feel threatened about being, uh, not having the skills. So if we in Sanitation and Water for All can again be a forum, identify what is needed and, and help each other to move along, I think that together we cannot um, uh, sorry, alone we cannot do, bring about the change that we need. We can only do small piecemeal. But under this umbrella that has gained such a high momentum, uh, as we have seen so far, we, we are able to maybe transform the sector into a higher level of performance than we know is possible, but we just don't right now know exactly how to do it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maylin. That, that sort of concludes the, the first round of interventions and um, you know, I, I've taken away certain common threads uh, across the, the five, five speakers. We've, we've heard things that we know already, so there are things around better and more coordination. We've heard things that, that uh, we've heard things ar around awareness raising and visibility in the sector. We've heard from Biomass about the importance of messaging. We've, he we've had a couple of tactics suggested to us, which is stronger outreach to the senior civil servants because we're in a, a political flux 
with ministers coming in and out. Uh, we've heard about the constant importance of monitoring and making sure that we can speak to tangible results. Nothing succeeds like success, and if we can uh, demonstrate those, those uh, tangible examples, then we get uh, greater buy-in and political ownership from our, from our ministerial uh, colleagues. We've, we've had other very practical suggestions around an inventory of shared resources from, from Heather, all ways in which we can try to address some of these challenges about how we translate very high-level political engagement at the international uh, at the international stage into something that is tangible and tractable at the national level. So that's my very quick potted summary of some of those threads that we've heard from the panelists. But I think now is the time to, to hear a little bit from you. So I'd, I'd welcome questions for the panel or reflections on what you've heard from the panel or if you feel that we're completely missing the purpose of the session and, and the, the main question about how do we sustain that political dialogue and you have the answer, then now is your time to share that. So I'd, I'd welcome from, from colleagues uh, in this room your, your thoughts and questions for the panel or your reflections on this central question. Over to you. Stunned silence. <laughs> ah, I see hands. So one at the back, uh, one here. Come on, we can make it three questions. Is there someone bold enough to put their hand up for a third? Excellent, well done on the right-hand side. If you could just introduce yourself before you ask your question. And if it's specific to a panelist, if you could say it's for X or Y, or if it's just a reflection, please go ahead. Uh, my name is Stanley Marty. I work with the Ghana Water Company Limited. Ghana. My question goes, um, I don't know whether it's a question, but to the second panelist, um, Baka Yiga. Yeah, you talked about the change in um, ministers, the change in political uh, leadership, um, the frequent changes. But what I want to say is um, there are uh, civil servants who work under these political leaders and they do almost everything. The political leaders are just to present the final stuff. Now, in the event of such changes, or we don't have these civil servants being changed as much as the political leaders, so there should be still that continuation instead of um, just a startup of a whole process. Mm -hmm. So um, our edge, I will urge those of us civil servants who work under this political leadership to work such that in the event of any change, there still will be that continuation other than a startup. Thank you. Okay, so I think this was, this was more of a comment. This was reinforcing that senior civil servants, because they're constant and not changing as much as political appointees are one way in which we can bed down our messages within bureaucracies and, and national systems. Is that, that right? So th that was more of a comment. I think it's building on, on, on the point that, that Baker made. Thank you for that. We had uh, a hand here in the, on the left-hand side. Uh, yeah, uh, Ned Breslin from Water for People. I think, um, I think these kinds of sessions and, and the movement of them are really difficult because I, um, I like the comment about we, you know, we need courage and we need to go from policy to practice and all that kind of stuff. It would be useful to see some of that because I think there is some good stuff out there. And, and actually, I was, I was wondering if our colleague from Liberia could comment. Um, we all struggle with monitoring. Um, there's constant, endless debates about monitoring. But it seems to me what Liberia has done, which is really interesting, is they've gone through a process of uh, mapping out the entire country and looking at the functionality of their systems. And they've had the courage to say, wow, a lot of this is off track, a lot of the funding has not gone well, um, we've got to rethink technologies, we've got to do a whole bunch of stuff, and it seems to me that what that has done is galvanized enormous support around changing that situation. And so the question for me is, you know, how has Liberia used that kind of work to build the political case for better investments in water and sanitation, to focus less on just getting boreholes drilled and more on making sure that water keeps flowing. And what can we learn in other countries and in other organizations that can actually build on that success? 
Okay, thank, thank you, Ned. That was a very specific question for Abdul, and I'll ask him to, to come in in a minute. But let's just take the third question and see, that gives Abdul some time to think, see whether this is specific to any of the uh, panelists or a general reflection. Sure, thank you. My name is Jenny Datu, and I'm with USAID. Um, I mean, I think that all of your comments have actually been very helpful. I was uh, most interested, actually, in receiving some comments from our colleague from um, the African Development Bank. Um, something that you said that others have sort of touched upon um, is this idea of, um, of the soft side of, uh, of the water sector, water supply and sanitation, and how that role really needs to be ramped up or really needs to be looked at as well, because I think we do tend to spend a lot of time, effort, and money talking about rehabilitation, improving investments, um, when a lot of it has to do with capacity building and um, institutional strengthening. Um, one of the things that I've observed is, while I completely agree with that comment, I think it's, um, it's difficult to assess. So how do you measure whether, how do you measure the value that um, improving institutional frameworks brings to um, improving su uh, water supply or increasing access of supply and sanitation. Because I think if we can better understand how to quantify something that I think is very difficult to quantify, so I recognize that, but maybe more of us would be inclined to work on that and to try to operationalize it in our programming. Okay. Thank, thank you, excellent question. Uh, and Malin, I'm wondering whether we could put you on the spot and see whether you have a rejoinder to, to that question. Um, but first we'll, we'll do Abdul uh, and his question from, from, from Ned. And uh, so, you know, what, what has worked in, in Liberia and how did you do it, I think was the terrible paraphrasing of Ned's question. Yeah, um, thank you very much for, for raising that, that issue. And I think it's quite uh, important because water point mapping, um, as he, he rightly put it, was a, a huge exercise that, that is serving this purpose currently in Liberia. We've been able to uh, link um, the mapping to planning for equity and investment. And the key, the key activity that is currently um, taking place in Liberia is the development of a sector investment plan. And the heavy results that we have is the water point mapping that was done. And this actually allows us to make the, the kind of analysis and support the sort of decisions that need to be made I mean, at, at the level of planning in country. Um, currently, one of the, the great, uh, probably, in fact, the most significant uh, approach we've been able to use with the SIP is to actually link um, what we call the SIP, and this SIP really, to a GIS. So really, people are able to plan from county, uh, district, and county levels uh, because of the way in which the analysis were done with the mapping. And we're hoping that one of those things you could learn from our uh, uh, experiences, I will be elaborating on this fully on Wednesday at, at the whole session, um, is that from, from mapping to, to planning, and allocating resources and actually exposing lead, uh, uh, county authorities to planning for the different levels of, of governance at their level is something that you could probably pick on. And not to say a lot about that because I want you to attend the session on Wednesday. <laughs> it might be good to attend and see what, what more you can, you can hear from me. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, so thank you, Abdul. Malin, you, you've intrigued people with your, your phrase, the, the softer side of change management, I think. Um, but I think the question was, how do, we, how do we assess that? How do we measure and how does that relate to, to, to changes in supply and, uh, and in you know, doing, doing more of the things that we should be doing? So do you have any insights? I'm not sure if I have insights because, of course, I have been grappling with exactly the same uh, challenge. I think it's one of these classical challenges of the sector. Um, when I was in Uganda, I was working at the ministry there before the African Development Bank. We got a lot of criticism from the uh, Minister of Finance asking, why are you putting so much money on these soft institutional things? We want to see more delivery in access directly. 
Because there, there is no real good result in terms of outputs. Sometimes even the medium-term outcome is difficult to show. Uh, for me, though, from the experience that we've seen, and it's not an answer, it's just a, a view, is that weak institutional development, uh, when we don't prepare it well, when we don't target it well, is a complete waste of money. And uh, then we should. If it's not good, then we may as well just put in more on the harder sides. But I think when we look at it in a more targeted way, and especially, in my view, when we look at it in a big way, uh, I think often what we do is we do a small institutional component or some small institutional support of training next to a hard project. And it's so piecemeal and small that it doesn't really bring about the change that we want. So I'm very much for saying if we're going to do it, we should do it really well and we should do it big. Um, uh, and also what I like to see is that we don't do it in a vacuum. Institutional development um, in a vacuum becomes not so relevant for those involved. And I'll give an example of that by what I mean. Um, in our support to the Central African Republic, uh, the African uh, Water Facility, which is hosted at ADB, is doing right now an institutional support, quite a large institutional support project to the government. At the same time, the, the, water, the bank's water and sanitation department is doing infrastructure investments in what is then seen as maybe not such a sustainable environment. And we've been asked, shouldn't you do the institutional first and investment next? But we said, no, let's do them hand in hand, in parallel, so that both are feeding into each other. So that those people who are inf uh, investing uh, in the infrastructure identify and online we see what is the impact of the institutional issues, that the institutional people do not create some high-level fluffy information, but something that is directly targeted and usable on these infrastructure projects. And it helps in this country that it's a small one where it's the same directory, the same people who are working on the two projects, that they can very easily integrate this. So, of course, there's other challenges around that support, but in terms of institutional capacity, that's, that's just my thoughts on that, but it's true, it's extremely challenging. So any other views on that would, uh, would be encouraging. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, maybe we could just give the panel uh, another quick round of applause. I, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've started to scratch the surface a little bit in this session. We've, we've heard some things that we, we know we know, and I think there are things which we know we don't know. And hopefully what we'll be doing in the second half of this session is trying to uncover some of those things that we know we don't know. Um, after the break, which is, which is right now, we're going to be coming back. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, we have two, uh, two great presentations. Uh, first of all, talking a little bit about... so. If, if uh, SWA operates around political prioritization at a very high level, what do we do at the other end of the spectrum where, where the rubber hits the road? And so uh, Dominique, I think, will be presenting on, on behalf of Dominique and, and Heather on, on country level support and the MPRI process that, that uh, SWA and its partners are heavily involved in. So that will, that will begin to round out that dimension of SWA's work for you. And then uh, towards the end of the session, we'll be focusing a little bit more on the monitoring framework as a whole within the sector, which I think for many of you who understand this is, is pretty confused. And Clarissa's going to try to, to chart a way through some of that confusion for you uh, and provide us with some insights. We're hoping that Robert might be able to, to join and give a little bit of a rejoinder on, on some of the JMP processes. So that's what we're going to be doing immediately after the break. Um, after those couple of presentations, we'll then try to get you working together around your tables on some pre-prepared questions that we have on uh, political prioritization, MPRI, and around uh, monitoring. So I'd like us to go outside, continue this discussion over coffee, and um, please be back here in 25 minutes. So that's uh, around 10 to 4, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, um, don't leave valuables in this room. <laughs>